change the pace a little bit. Um, I want to bring on the CEO of one of the uh, buzziest startups uh, we've heard about in a long time. Haven't seen him on stage for quite some time. Um, and someone who heads one of the buzziest entertainment and sports properties in the world. Please welcome Roni Abovitz and Adam Silver. Handmaid's Tale, professional sports, mixed reality, we got it all here. It's all happening. We're ready. Roni, Adam, why are you guys on stage together? Well, we're partners with Magic Leap, and we're thrilled that we were invited to be here with Roni and be part of this presentation. I think one of the things we spend a lot of time at, at the NBA is what the next generation presentation of sports will be. And, you know, we've, we've watched sort of the trends over the years where, where we've gone obviously to high definition, which has made a huge difference to sports fans. We've looked at virtual reality, we've looked at augmented reality, and then Roni, I think beginning about three years ago when we met, came to me and said, we have something that's gonna blow you away that is far different than anything you've seen before. And we've really enjoyed partnering um, with Magic Leap now, and as I'll let Roni speak to the announcement that, and, and to the product that's coming to market, but I think we're honored, in essence, to be one of their initial partners. We're taking, in essence, our, our content, our sports content, and then looking for new ways to present it and to ultimately find better ways to engage fans. Because at the end of the day, it's about storytelling, and it's about bringing those experiences that we've all had when, as sports fans when we're physically in arenas and working with technology to try to replicate that experience. And, and while we've, we've made a lot of progress over the years, we've never quite found a way to take that experience that you have, that emotional experience that you have at being in a game, and, and found a way to scale it and translate it through technology. And that's where we see the opportunity with Magic Leap. So, Ronnie, I think everyone in this room knows what Magic Leap is, but just on the off chance, they don't. Let's just describe what the company is, what you're working on. Let me get That's why about. he should have gone first. But what, 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 <laughs> what, how, how you're going to work with Adam in the NBA. We make these really nutritious whole grain bagels. There you go. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, we're, we're building a new computer platform, and our theory is that um, you know, the economy was based on like this information age, and computing is really based on transfer of information. But kind of the gut was... It's, human experience is not just data. It's, it's emotion, it's like feeling a presence and like something more than just data. And really we're building a computer for what we think of as the age of experience or experiential economy. Wearable product. It's a wearable product. We, in December we had a reveal. Uh, so Magic League One Creator Edition will be shipping in 18. Uh, there'll be more news uh, coming soon. Um, you know, the next, next few months. And it's, it's what most of us call augmented reality, right? You're looking through it, you can see the world, it, it and gets, then you can bring it. gets upset others. when you call it that. Yeah, I know. So uh, <laughs> the, 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 the reason, I call it spatial computing with digital light field, and I'll give you the reason. So um, AR today tends to mean I hold up a phone yeah. and I see like stickers through a pass-through video, and there's like all these really cool AR tools, but most of the world associates that with holding a phone up. And our device, our technology experience are all fundamentally different from that. So uh, there, there used to be like the idea of augmented reality in science fiction that we're closer to, but the pop culture word AR doesn't really apply to what we do anymore. So the story about you guys is you have this amazing technology. Everyone who goes down to Florida and signs an NDA comes back and says, it's amazing. I can't tell you about it, but it's, it's amazing. Um, we can talk about some of that back history. Okay. Um, you did not bring the, the product here on stage. We can't see it. Um, and part of the challenge of, of even talking about this stuff is that you have to wear it to experience it. I have not been to Florida. I have not signed your NDA. I don't know what it's like. Um, we wanted to try to tell people a little bit more about it, though, right? Yeah, sure. So um, what we revealed, it's, uh, there's a, a component we call lightware, which is really uh, an important part of why I think of a spatial computing. It, it senses you. So we're actually, you get like emotional state, you can get like information and biomarkers about a person. You sense the world around you. Uh, because if you don't have context, um, and you just have like something floating in space, it makes no sense. And then we really spent a mass amount of effort and capital building a digital light field signal. And all of that is really to look at your eye and brain evolved for millions of years into something that's many billions of years old. Like the physics of how light in the universe works with your biology 
our, our goal was like, that's set. Let's not screw that up. And to not screw that up required going down a very difficult path of trying to understand what is going on there. Like, what's the physics? What's the neurotechnology? What's the neuroanatomy happening? And going, that's not off the shelf stuff. And how do we like gently slipstream into that and not disrupt things? So we want to talk to your visual cortex in a really biologically friendly way. And that, that, that was this whole effort to make something new uh, so that you can put something on and have experiences that really feel kind of magical. So easy for you to say. It's hard like, for us what to are get we our head about? around. Yeah. Um, you will soon. Yeah, so in lieu of being able to actually use it ourselves, we have, we have someone describing what the, this is like. Should yeah, we, we, have a, we have a, unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but uh, a little, a little uh, special let's video. Let's play that video. Hello, my name is Shaquille O'Neal. First of all, I would like to say welcome to the 2018 Code Conference. I'd like to give a special shout out to Roni and my good friend Adam. When I went to Magic Leap, I put on a pair of these glasses and I watched a full court game right here. Not flat, LeBron was right here. I seen LeBron taking coach, like it was the most amazing thing. And then I went over here and I'm watching the Orlando Magic play the Los Angeles Lakers. So I think the NBA, once they get a hold of this technology and some of the players, they're really gonna wanna integrate their material and their content with Magic League, and it's about to be a wonderful thing. When I first saw the technology, I begged the people at Magic League, I said, please let me be inside people's glasses when they put them on. So I came and they put all the little balls on me and we did a few things, and I actually saw it. And then when I saw it, it made me feel like I had a twin brother. Because I put these glasses on and I saw the most beautiful, tall black guy I've ever seen in my life. And I was like, oh, that's me. Make sure you get your son. Have fun at the 2018 Code Conference. Shaq, signing off. There you go. So, we do a shout out to Shaq. It's Thank great to that. get a shout out to Shaq. That's, that's the bucket list the, item for me. You know, the, the most incredible part of the technology is they found a pair of glasses that would fit around Shaq's head. I was, yeah. Those, I was are, those are production it. glasses. That's not a special Shaq size. That thing. is a Magic Leap large that he's wearing, so uh, he hit the, the outer edge of our, of our human This practice. points to one of the big challenges, right, of, of what you've been working on and what you're eventually going to sell this year is it's people talking about what the experience is like. Um, and so maybe you guys can describe sort of what the NBA version of this is like, but then more broadly I'm thinking, this is a real marketing challenge for you guys. You've got a guy wearing glasses talking about what something's like. Well, here, here's the way we thought about it. I'll have Adam talk. Like, there's, there's sort of amazing experiences. Like, the NBA basketball's been around for, like, more than a century. So we kind of know what the great basketball experiences are. So there's, like, on the court. There's courtside. There's, like, the skybox where you look down. And there's, like, the sports bar. And we were thinking, like, what is the ultimate fan experience? And, like, what mobile and television don't really deliver um, but you have to actually go to the game or be a player, or meeting a player, like actually meeting Shaq, like he's, he's like, most people, I'm like 6'1 and something, but like Shaq, I'm like doing that too. So actually uh, seeing Shaq was in my office a few months back, and then seeing digital Shaq in my office last week, like he's standing there, it's like the exact same head perspective, there he is, like in my office. So was, the idea of like presence, you can actually meet someone. So there's all these kind of super fan experiences we're thinking about. So part of what we're doing is like, what I call like skybox or tabletop, there's like the arena and there's all the players running around. And then there's like um, something we call screens. We can have like your sports bar. You can get your sports bar on. You have like five or six or seven or eight like televisions running different camera angles. So suddenly you could be anywhere. Like we'd be sitting right here and just throw a bunch of TV screens and now you're watching like one game from different perspectives or all your favorite games at the same time. And then it's like actually like meeting a player or having like, let's say someone like, you know, like LeBron dunks and now we want to see that right now. So like part of the court appears, someone is here, full scale dunking a basketball. So all of those things are possible. And what we wanted to do at the NBA was like begin to like collaborate in so the greater space. What's the first it. iteration of this, Adam? Well, so, so kind of where I started today is that from our standpoint, while it's amazing what we've been able to do through television in taking the experience to fans, it doesn't come close to replicating what the experience is in the arena. And so, and, and, and I'd go then, the next step is where just even recently we used to st say, before we start getting involved with Magic Leap, that the goal was to replicate that courtside experience. But then when Roni sort of brought his vision to us, it was, well, you can do even better than the, the Jack Nicholson courtside seat. As he was just describing, you can also have all kinds of 
screens of information available to you. So you're watching the game and that you can instantly know statistics or probabilities. And then beyond that, where the court's here, this is the court side seat is here, you can then be on the court, you can be over the court, you can have all sort of different so, perspectives. So when this launches this year, this is, what do we call this, do we call this an NBA app? Yes. Um, um, am I watching a game that I could also watch on linear TV? Is it, is it something that's not on linear TV? How, how are you thinking this? So way? our initial, it's, it's actually a three-way partnership with Turner Sports, the NBA, and Magic Leap. So Turner owns for all platforms the games they license for, uh, from us. So they can take the games that you now see on TNT and then through this app and through people who have the lightware equipment can then make those games also available. And so, yes, they're available through conventional linear television, but for those people who want this special experience. And, and for us, really the opportunity is, it's, it's always t to me an issue I keep coming back to of scale in that our buildings are largely sold out and, and certainly all the courtside seats are sold out in every arena. And the challenge has always been as we have, I mean, Last year, a billion people, one out of seven people on the planet, watched some portion of an NBA game, which is quite unbelievable. And our games are distributed in 210 countries. But the, the question is, but they're not quite sharing in that experience that Roni talked about, those so-called lifelong memories that people have had from going to sporting events, from experiencing them with friends and family members. And we'll see. I mean, I'd say this is a first iteration. and. Um, you know, I signed the NDA too, and I and, and so I've I've seen a first generation of it. But part of from the NBA standpoint, our notion in, in entering this partnership was please use our content. We we'd like you to experiment. We have a lot of games, and we think we until we start getting feedback from users, we're really not going to understand what's the most. This is an experiment aspect. for you. You're not really well, sure what it's going to be. Everything. I mean, it's it, it's an experiment to the extent that I think any new product you put out there for consumers and yeah. haven't gotten feedback yet, I think, you know, I have my own sense of what I think it'll be based on my reaction to it and having seen other technologies out there and have ex experimented with some of the other forms of reality that we've talked about before. So I'm really excited about it, but I have no doubt that what we're going to see in five years is going to be a lot better than what we're going to see in this year and et cetera. There, there are a bunch of VR experiences that let you sit courtside or, right. or ringside or wherever you want to be at a sports event. Um, they haven't taken off, and, and Ronnie, you'll say that your tech is much better than theirs, and so for argument's sake, let's say that's the case. But the other argument is that actually watching tele television sports is great. You get a million different angles, you don't have to put a headset on, you can watch it with your friends. Um, maybe it's better to be live, but um, watching on your couch is awesome. So how are, what's, the, what's the urge to improve upon that? Well, go ahead. I was going to say, like, uh, so let's say we we're all watching together. Um, and what we're doing, I don't lose you guys. We could be hanging out. I could we're wearing like, goggles. But I, I, I don't lose seeing you. I still see you. I could still see family. You could still watch your kids. So you still see the real world. And then you have digital things not superimposed on it. They're just actually integrated into it. Like you may have a 60-inch real TV. Now you have five digital TVs that just appeared. And you may have a part of your family room that didn't have anything there before. And suddenly, there's part of a basketball court there. But you still see your dog running around. So you don't lose the social aspect of, of being together. That's one thing I think that's fundamentally important. If you actually shut out the world completely, then I think it's very isolating. So we're not isolating you at all. You can, you can like watch a game, go to your kitchen, grab a beer. You're still watching the game. You say hi to friends. Go back and sit down. And it's aware of what you're doing. Like if you want to get up and go do something, you can just pause everything because it knew you went, you got up and went somewhere. You can go upstairs, get something. Suddenly the game reappears upstairs. So have, it has this like awareness of what you're doing. So it takes everything you love about, let's say, normal television and amplifies that. Adam, your, your ratings are up. You're one of the few people in TV doing better than you did last year and better than you did two years ago. Um, do you feel like this is something you have to do to make sure that keeps happening? Or, or is this a just let's see what it looks no, like? No, I, I, I think. I think it is something we feel we have to do, and I, I think we keep looking to push the envelope. And if you look at what you know, Disney and ABC and ESPN have done with our telecasts and our partners at Turner versus where we were five years ago and ten years ago, it's a much different experience now. It's a combination of 
much better video quality through high definition. It's better audio that you get. It's better access that you get. And I guess my answer to your question would be, remember, it's not so long ago that people used to, sit, people used to feel when these games were made available on television that we had to black them out in markets in order to sell tickets. Now, to me, we're sort of looking at a very, it, the, the notion of why we're doing this, if it's a good experience on television, people still want to go to the arenas. Even though these games are available in high definition, beautiful large monitors, they're fairly affordable, people almost will all agree that if they could get a courtside ticket to an NBA game, to Lakers or Clippers in town here or to the Warriors, that that's the best possible experience. So our view is there's still a large segment of the marketplace that while they may not be able to afford or have the ability or even the vast majority of our fans don't even live in the United States, let alone get to an arena. And if you could, the closest thing possible to bring that experience to them through new technology, we think it's, there'll be enormous demand for it. Ronnie, when you said 2018, want to narrow that down for when we're actually going to have these things in our hands? That's this year, 2018. Yeah. It makes it sound like we're shipping often. this year. So shipping this year, <laughs> we, committed we, to that. We are continuously seeding uh, early access developers. We've been doing that okay. since last summer, so that's happening. Um, what are they going to cost? Sometime in the spring, we'll be announcing more. You'll announce more information this spring. More information what, what, about what are they going to cost? Mobility. Um, we'll announce pricing the day and date of sale. I, but someone, good... someone who seemed like they knew something told me that they were ballparking at around a thousand bucks. Is that in the range? Um, I think we're pricing it. It's, it's, it's a premium computer, so I would think of it that way. It's an expensive computer you're going to put on your face. Who, who do you think the audience for this first iteration is? So magically, one uh, we call it Creator Edition. So it's people who are enthusiasts, developers, creators, brands, artists, partners people that want to get an early taste of what the future looks like. Um, it's not necessarily for everyone right away. Um, but it is for people, but we're not saying it's, it's not a dev kit in the sense that um, you know, we're not blocking. Anyone could be a creator. If you have like creator and you want to tinker and you want to play with what's coming, uh, Magical Living Creator Edition for you. And, and where do you need to get it to pricing wise where you think this is a mass market product? I think the Magic League One Creator Edition price point we will have a product line in that price point probably for the company's history, and we'll probably have some above and we'll have some below. So I think we're trying to establish certain tiers. Like we're not going to be a single product company over time. So just like you know, other companies have like, you know, they have a cascade of like, you know, really high end for like prosumers, professionals. Right. This is think of this as like prosumerish, and then we'll have even higher end for like, you know, hyper pro, and then we'll have like, you know, wide mass market. Right. What's what what's a wide mass market price? Two hundred bucks, three hundred bucks? Can no. you get to that? No. I think I think Magic Leap is like, you know, like think higher end mobile phone to higher end tablet zone is probably our floor. That's your floor. So that's yeah. my iPhone X is a thousand bucks, right? Without naming anybody, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is not something you're gonna dip into casually. So you've got to get really great content like the NBA, presumably. How, how much more stuff do you need before you can make this? A also, as a, as a device, um, you, get a, you get multiple computers. You, get, you don't have to buy another computer. You get a full-blown computer in your pocket. Um, you have like this whole computer machine AI system with digital light field there. Yeah. So the number of devices it's potentially replacing, if you actually add all that up, like at some point, we're not saying for ML1, everyone will, will go down this path, but your phones, your televisions, your laptops, your tablets, that add up to thousands or tens of thousands of dollars all get virtualized. So the economy of what we're building actually um, can replace, not on day one, but over the next, you know, let's say, Gen 2, Gen 3, a whole suite of consumer electronics. And you're out here with the NBA. You're pitching this as a consumer product. A lot of folks think that VR, AR, mixed reality, spatial computing, this is, a, this is eventually going to be an enterprise product. This is going to be something that the military uses, you use in a factory, the police use it. That seems more practical than asking people to wear these things on their face. I think it's totally about um, experience. I think right now what we've got is a mismatch of like I call information age companies, like shoving information age stuff onto a device which is really experiential. What I mean by experiential is like the visual quality has to make you feel and like it's amazing. There's no other way to get that. It's not like just data in front of me. It's not a data appliance. Um, beautiful sound field, like just stuff that actually moves you so that you're, you know, just like you put on a really great pair of headphones to get amazing sound like a concert. They're not the prettiest things in the world. They're like World War II headphone cans. But you do it because the sound's amazing and you want that amazing sonic experience. Um, then you have little tiny earbuds for just everyday phone calls. So think of what we're, we're doing is people want an amazing visual sonic experience where 
putting that on versus like driving for two hours in traffic and spending hundreds of dollars to go do something else, it's now digitally brought into my home. So the convenience factor um, at some point will be kind of amazing relative to like what you need to do to get that same experience another way. One of the other parts of the Magic Leap narrative is people go down to Florida, they sign the NDA, they say it's amazing, and then they say quietly, I don't, I don't think this thing is, can be a product. I don't, it seems like they're a ways away from making this an actual product that consumers can get their hands on. Uh, there was a piece about a year and a half ago that, that said you guys were having real trouble with that. You've been working on this for years. You've raised $2 billion. What is, what, and you say this year is, it's coming out. What is the thing you had to solve to actually get this into people's hands? So the company literally started in my garage. Um, and if you go to Magically Fall 2014, the light field signal generator is like half of a room. It's like this multi-hundred pound gigantic beast. So that's where we are. And all that was doing was the visual signal. So today, we shrunk that down into something that's a nanostructure uh, wafer. So we took microelectronics and large-scale optoelectronics, and we built an entire factory, even designing the machines that make our wafers, almost like what Intel might do for silicon. Was there one key thing that you had to solve before this could show up? So, we put, hands? so like, we put a mass amount of energy solving the digital light field problem. That was like number one. And then we had to marry that to perception. And really, perception is computer vision and sensing of the world and you at the same time in real time against what our digital light field signal. It was like a bunch of nearly impossible problems, incredibly hard problems. So if you were joining Magic in 2014, you were super brave. In 15, you were super brave. In 16, you were super brave. 17, you, you know, like all of a sudden, you could see the light. And now, like, it looks like, oh, it's all, all these problems have been solved. So, I mean, the first few years of the company were just intense. It's like joining SpaceX when there's just a hangar and, and a whiteboard saying, we're going to go, like, shoot stuff into orbit. Yeah. And for a while, you were showing people, this is what it looks like. And yeah. then you got blowback because it actually wasn't what it looked like. It was a, it was a rendering. It wasn't the actual experience. This is why you didn't show us uh, sort of, the, what do you call it, the pass-through? Uh, you, you weren't showing us what it looks like with, with the product on your face. It was Shaq describing it. So what, what we showed uh, Shaq wearing is actually a Magic Leap one. Yeah, yeah he's wearing it, but, he, but you're not seeing it from his eyes. You still have to put the thing on to actually understand what it's like. Right, so one of the dilemmas was um, we did shot through Magic Leap tech videos, and we also did, like, here's what the experience is like. And it's a little bit tricky because you actually need to experience it directly. Right. Um, there's not really a monitor, and this is probably the most interesting thing. Um, think about building a computer where your brain is the monitor. And, and you're not looking at a monitor, so you actually need to be, you have to close the loop on the system, and you have to directly experience it. So actually filming that automatically makes that not the experience anymore. So showing that in video is like very tricky because it's not yeah. present. Like you're present now, but looking at a photo of you is not like Peter really. It's gonna did. be a real marketing challenge. You have to go stick it on people's heads individually. Adam. Um, well, I only say about that. I mean, however, you know, Roni's describing it. We I brought think, it to Adam. I think when you see it, then yeah. you'll either see there's value or not. I, I, I think I. I signed the NDA too, so I'm not allowed to say more. But I, I think it's just, it's for the people here who are watching, it's, it is. I understand the challenge in sort of describing it, and that video is Steve Jobs brought the iPhone up, took it right. out of his pocket, said, here's the phone. Right. right. And then he sat down and. But and I think pieces. we'll be at, you know, Roni will be at that point soon, and then people will judge for themselves. Adam, I mentioned earlier, uh, your ratings are up. Uh, everything else is down. The NFL is down. Grammys are down. That makes sense because there's lots of things competing with TV for your time. So you guys are up. I, you held your fingers up. Uh, I crossed them. Um, is, is it luck that the, you're from a smaller base in the NFL, but is it luck that, that you guys are increasing your ratings? Well, I only say, well, it's true that the NFL, for example, was down a bit from an absolute standpoint, they're the highest rated programming on television. Yep. And it's interesting if you look at the trend over you know, roughly the last two decades. So in, in 2017, 81 of the, mo of the highest rated 100 programs were live sports. And if you go back to 2000, it was 13. So both on an objective standard and on a relative basis, live sports are more than holding their own. So while other leagues have ebbs and flows in their ratings, that I think, if anything, right now, live sports are what are holding the bundle together. It's the programming that is differentiated and exclusively available through cable and satellite that while there's some 
small packages that are available through some of the over-the-top services. If you are a sports fan, you still need to get those conventional packages to get sports. And when in an aggregate, we're more popular than we've ever been. So I certainly don't think that's luck. And you know, enormous amount of the credit goes to our players, of course, who are these incredible athletes. And I think one of the things that attracted Magic Leap and Roney to the NBA was this notion, again, of replicating that experience through technology because it's so enthralling to see it in person. But again, we're just limited in scale by the size of our arenas. One, one of the narratives around, the, everyone had a different theory about why the NFL ratings are down, and mine is because there's Snapchat and lots of things to watch. But one of the arguments was, oh, people are turned off socially. They don't, they don't like the protests or Trump has affected them. Um, the NBA is socially very progressive. You've got a lot of really outspoken players um, who are really on the sort of generally on the left side of the political spectrum. You've got coaches like Steve Kerr and Greg Popovich who are uh, very vocal about their dislike for Trump. Um, why is the NBA more outspoken as a league? Why are the players and coaches more vociferous? And, and why do you think that hasn't hurt the league? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I, I think it has more to do with the, the DNA of our league than anything that's happening at the moment. If you look back um, over the course of, let's say, 50 years um, at the, the original, the activists who in the 60s in our league, people like Bill Russell, you know, people like Wayne Embry, you know, and, and others, Bob Cousy was one of the early pioneers of, of the Players Association in our league who went out and fought for civil rights, for human rights. I mean, Bill Russell was stood with Martin Luther King for his I Have a Dream speech on, on the mall in Washington. And I think it's, it, this is, a, a, it's, it's part of what is the fabric of our league that's been passed down from generation to generation. I feel like that, that's something that I've inherited as part of this league. And but I think it was that, also apolitical for a while, and Michael Jordan famously said Republicans wear shoes too, and for a long, people well, weren't as active politically. Well, some weren't, ago. some weren't, and that was Michael, but I think also that was his personal choice at the huh? time. But I'm saying if, if you look back over the history of this league, there's a very clear through line in terms of, it's not just political, uh, being politically outspoken, but I think it's one based on what the core values of this league are. And I think there are things that are inherent in this sport that maybe differentiates us from others. I think that, I think that, for example, it's a sport that lends itself to social media because the players are not hidden by helmets or tucked under a cap or in dugouts during between innings. I mean, they, they, they're acculturated around this game where they're this close to fans. And they're in shorts. And they're in shorts. They have barely anything on people. They're, they, they're, they play offense and defense. The star players are on the floor for yeah. virtually the entire game. And, and again, I think that they, w what's happening, I think that technology is in part responsible for what we're seeing in the league because social media has allowed them to speak directly to fans and to demonstrate that they are the multi-dimensional people they are. And so it's not just a function of what they do on the court. And I think, to their credit, they've taken advantage of that platform. And I mean, sometimes it's, it's warts and all. It's not, it's, it, it, not all of it makes us more popular. It turns some people off or even some of the things completely apolitical that players are talking about that people don't appreciate and but but I accept that it, they're they're highly relevant to everything that's happening. Do you think on social society. media has increased your television ratings? Yes, I, to me, no question about it. I, I you know when I look at what in you know as I said before, you know one out of seven people on the planet have watched a portion of our game. We have a social media community that we estimate with globally at about 1.4 billion. When you look at the, the followings for teams, individual players, the league, the, our partnerships with companies like Tencent in China, it's enormous. And and in the, it it's but you partly think people what draws me. are consuming it on social and more likely to watch it on TV. Yes, because, because I think it, it comes back to a lot of what Roni and I have talked about about these experiences. That the richer the experiences are, the more that you bring people into the lives of these players, the more they care about the stories, the more attracted they are to the telecast. So it's not just one-dimensional players running up and down the court that they they're 
you know, they're from somewhere, they overcame certain obstacles. It's like watching the Olympics now. I'm sure a lot of us are drawn to watch sporting events that we'll, we won't watch for another four years. But I think NBC does a fantastic job giving you the backstory, telling you why you should care about these individual athletes. And I think that's what social media has done for our players. And I say, not all of it appeals to everyone, but there's virtually something for everyone. And when you have a league where 25% of our players, for example, were born outside of the United States, and they're, they're diverse they're in so many different ways that I think that in many ways they are the, the new face of America, you know, and so when, and, and for, it, it demonstrates the, what, the opportunities that come from inclusion, that come from open borders by taking the very best players from all around the world and having them play in one league based in the United States and Canada. I, you know, so I think it's a great statement also about, about our country. It's almost like you're pro-immigration. Absolutely. I have other questions, but, but we should let you guys uh, ask them if you're brave. And if not, we'll just keep talking. There's someone here. We'll take brave questions. Hi. Uh, so I am a uh, subscriber to NBA League Pass. Thank you. The, the most expensive version of it, by Thank the way. Thank you again. Which, which, <laughs> which takes out ads and replaces uh, a lot of the, all that ad space with actually the in arena action. Right. Which I don't. It's funny, like not a lot of people, I feel like, know about that, but I have to tell you, it is literally the most transporting thing, and that's just happening on a two-dimensional television set, right? And so it literally feels like, like I'm rooting, I, I go this from rooting really for Kevin for. Durant to somebody like trying to make a bucket to Ronnie wants to sell you an expensive No, headset. no, he, he, is, our, wait, he wait. is like basically describing why we're building this. So I guess the, the, the question is, uh, how, how with, with the experience getting better outside of the arena, right, right. and actually getting better in the home, how are, the, how are the team owners reacting to a lot of these efforts, um, you know, when, you know, the, the experience in the arena is actually competitive to the experience that you're building? Well, you know, first of all, I, you know, I'll, it's up to Roni. I don't know what the rules are in saying their names, but three of our NBA owners actually are investors in Magic Leap, so that's one way they're reacting. But I mean, and the particular um, not bad. you know product you're talking about again, it was a more in some ways a more primitive way of sharing that experience than what uh, Magic Leap will do. But I learned it from traveling internationally, where fans in China, in India, and in South Africa were saying you know, what's going on in your arenas when we're otherwise going to commercials? And when you're in our arenas, it's nonstop entertainment. And again, there was a time when people, Red Auerbach famously fought mascots and dancers and said, I want none of that. And now all 30 teams do it. But there was a sense that it, it is more than a basketball game. And if we could deliver that, it would increase the entertainment value. And I think our owners are reacting very well to it. Of course, it's, it's a different economic model when you're increasing the subscription price in exchange, you know, like a lot of products do in, in exchange for taking out the ads. But in our case, it's not just taking out the ads. We're substituting it with other programming you wouldn't otherwise see on television. And so, I, again, you know, I, I, cr I credit our owners, I mean, many of them technology, people like Paul Allen and Mark Cuban and, and, and uh, Paul Jacobs, you know, a lot of them are very much technologists and are pushing the league office and saying you should be experimenting with companies like Magic Leap and others that are represented in this room and finding new ways to, again, replicate that great arena experience through technology. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Those are good questions. Yeah, yeah they're good. There's smart people who show up at this event. <laughs> hey, a uh, question for both Adam and uh, Roni. Um, in the short term, I guess one to two years out, based on your experience with the Magic Leap technology, what do you guys think are the most compelling uh, consumer applications of it? Um, well, I only know one. <laughs> <laughs> NBA games. I'll, I'll center around <laughs> since we're since we're talking about the NBA. Um, if you were uh, doing like a league pass or NBA experience, first of all. Just imagine being able to conjure up, um, you know, like four, six, maybe even eight screens, just anywhere. Like here, you're hanging out at the beach at some point or in your living room. And then let's say you pick a game and now you're getting broadcast from different camera angles. And then suddenly the, you can have like this skybox view where you see that and also the players, small, are running on the court. And you're seeing all that with like stats and data. You could freeze that. And let's say there's an amazing moment. You know, there's like this like twirl dunk and you just smashes the backboard and you're like, that's amazing. You're like, I want to see that. And that just like shows up. 
I think you're going to see that in the next one to two years. And we're going to we're going to be very agile and iterate. And like you know, the early super fans are going to say more of this, less of that. Like more, you know, I want an actual shack in my living room, or I want small shack dunking. Like you'll basically be telling us if you're in early, you get to dictate what, where it's going to go. So would you say it's a stationary multi-screen experience? So imagine you have a whole bunch of screens, and you have like a real like arena with small players. And you can have a volume, like what I think of as like volumetric cinematography. There's actually like a player and like a court there in your living room. You get all that going on at the same time. Um, so it's not a stationary, it's, it's like basically having pieces of that like amazing experience Adam's talking about, like in your home or in some other space that you could decide, I want this or I don't want that. So it gives you a lot of control. And let's say the best feelings of being in like, let's say the ultimate is being in the arena in the arena. We're trying to bring the best moments and experience of that to you wherever you are. Got it. Thank you. That'd be awesome. One last quick question. Hi, uh, Dan Unger from Surfer. Uh, I was curious to get both of your thoughts on the rise of esports and how you see each of your uh, different areas really playing into that in the next few years. Sure. I'll, I'll start. So um, we're actually launching an esports league in the spring of this year with our partners at Take Two. So around our NBA 2K game, um, which is enormously popular, and we're watching what's happening on Twitch with enormous, you know, 100 million people a month, you know, approximately, you know, two hours a day of consumption of esports. So it's something we're fascinated with, and and for us, it's it's a bit of a, a twofer in that, you know, both we're experimenting in, in esports, but it's also around an NBA game, and I think along the same lines that that you guys with, are in Twitch now, right? We're in Twitch now. What we're actually streaming. G League, our minor league games on Twitch, we'll, we'll likely do something on Twitch with our new esports league as well. But in the same way, I think that your question before about does social media consumption of NBA lead to people watching more games, we also see a direct correlation with the consumption, the, the playing of NBA 2K with the desire to watch the real product as well. The, the difference is, just so it's clear, in, in NBA 2K, the game, if you buy it, you're playing in the character of, for the most part, a current NBA player. Our eSports League will have nothing to do with those NBA players. There'll be an entirely new set of professional gamers, athletes, who will be competing five on five. So I, I'm fascinated with it. I, you know, I think it, it creates a big opportunity. And just looking back to the data, and when you see the amount of consumption that's happening on Twitch, YouTube as well, it's not as much live, but enormous amount of, you know, I've talked to Susan about it, enormous number of consumption hours of esports there. So it's, it's the, the other thing I'll say is, as we look to expand our league, we're starting, we're launching 17 of our 30 NBA teams are launching as part of this league. And I think we'll fairly quickly get to 30. But in, in the world of esports, we can add a team in Shanghai. Yep. We can add a team in Mumbai. Something that, at least based on the constraints of air travel right now, I think is almost impossible in, in, our M in the NBA league. We're going to leave it there. Um, we're going to take a really quick break. Enough time for you to go to the bathroom, grab a cup of coffee, come back at 4.40. Roni, Adam, thank, thank you so you much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.